Good morning. How are we doing? Last night was the beer tasting, so hopefully not too too much veins now running, not 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 too much beer running through your veins, and ready to start. We have the luxury of having Blanca Rodriguez with us. She started uh, her career nearby here, down in Valencia, where she studied, and uh, she's been spending time uh, across the pond in Natalia's lab. As a, I think was the, that was the postdoc, wasn't it? And uh, since uh, 15 years, she's been in, back in Oxford, where she's been an icebreaker in the area of computational modeling. She has developed uh, quite a few, uh, no, quite a nice track of papers in the area, demonstrating how when you capture the mechanistic knowledge of physiology, you can ask uh, interesting questions to these models that you have developed and sometimes explain and other times uh, predict uh, both mechanistic uh, 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 explanations or, or new findings and, for example, as we are going to hear today, uh, predict the impact of, uh, of drugs and about their safety. This is the concept that we are, uh, as a community, uh, pushing forward, convincing that these models can be a very useful tool to uh, screen drugs, to try new devices, to try new therapies before going into the animal or to the other physical models. So it's another pathway to bring the evidence about the safety and effectiveness of the treatments. And it's a very exciting area. So uh, it's a luxury to, to have uh, Blanca with us today to explain to hear about uh, these avenues, to hear about some early success stories in this area. And uh, I'll give her the room. So thank you very much, and hopefully you enjoy. And uh, do, do, do please make questions. This is about learning. And whenever you are lost, I will, uh, let's, let's try to raise the rate of participation. So please make questions. Pablo, is, is this my water? Okay, thanks very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I, I love this summer school and I try to come every, every time I'm invited. Um, so just, just to, to give you an overview, I'm an engineer by training. I did, um, I did uh, engineering in Valencia and my PhD in Valencia in engineering, but already focused on uh, cardiac modeling and simulation. And then I went to a biomedical engineering lab and now I work in a computer science department. So when I joined Oxford, I was the only one who was doing cardiac modeling in the department. I joined as a postdoc. And then my career has been a bit unusual because it's been based on uh, fellowships. So external funding that has funded myself and also my research program over the years. So I started on, a, on a, an intermediate fellowship in 2007. Um, and that lasted for a bit longer than five years because of maternity leaves. And then I, I went on a senior research fellowship with Wellcome Trust. Again, uh, funding 100% of my salary, so I was free to do research, and that was renewed last year. So I'm going to be uh, for over 15 years on research fellowships. So if any of you is interested in research fellowships, I'm really happy to talk about it, because I have quite a lot of experience, not only as an applicant, um, uh, as an engineer, uh, uh, acquiring funding in biomedical sciences, but I've also been in panels. So I do understand quite well what it takes to get this funding that usually is awarded to biomedical scientists, but that people like us can acquire. And of course, Pablo is on a, a similar track. So very happy to talk about career paths that are not necessarily only academia or only um, um, teaching and research combined, but just research. So um, the first thing I always do is to introduce the, the setup in which we work. So our work is based, our, our uh, group is based in uh, computer science, as I say, and we, as I said, and we work very closely with other people in Oxford in biomedical engineering and also mathematics. But what we do is really m very much embedded in interdisciplinary collaborations and intersectoral collaborations. So we, uh, W even though we are in a computer science department, we work very closely with experimentalist clinicians and also pharmaceutical industry. So we work very closely with industry and we enjoy that quite a lot because it brings very novel ideas to our research program. 
And we also work with uh, regulators, and I'll be speaking a little bit about the work we do in that space as well. So based in computer science, but lots of arms in different uh, uh, collaborations across the world. So what I want to talk to you about is today is the concept of using multi-scale modeling and simulation, very much simulation science, in the context of drug therapy development and, and other topics. So one of the, co the, the, the streams of work we have been really developing over the years is the use of multi-scale modeling and simulation in drug testing. So you, you would know that if you're taking a medicine, this has undergone a series of testings. Uh, first in vitro to characterize how the medicine is acting on your body, on different aspects of your body. Then animal testing. Uh, if this is successful, it goes into clinical trials. The first clinical trials are performed in healthy volunteers. So people who are normal healthy and that take the drug and you see whether the, there is safety concerns. And then it goes into uh, disease people to test for efficacy. So there is a new movement that is actually very strong at the moment uh, in terms of using models, virtual models and simulations for testing of drugs, but ev even more importantly in devices. And if you don't know about it, it is really worth reading the papers by Tina Morrison, for example, on uh, simulation science for regulatory purposes. So it's very much the same concept that you have in other areas of engineering, where the cars or planes are designed using simulation and, and modeling, but for medical therapies. And for some strange reason, we are way behind in biomedical sciences in the use of this modeling and simulation. It may very well be a social context. So in biomedical sciences, people are not used to using uh, multi-scale modeling and simulations because they come from bi biomedical sciences. Their training is biomedical sciences. Whereas in engineering, everybody's used to using uh, quantitative approaches. So uh, we are behind, but now there is a strong push to using this in silico trials for devices, for medical therapies in general, and I'll, I'll, I'll be speaking about drug development. So one of the huge problems in addressing this uh, issue of drug development, drug development is um, dealing with population heterogeneity. So in, in order to, uh, to test or assess a therapy, we need to consider that when released to the market, it is going to go to a wide population that is very different. So if you look inside the room, you will see a, a variability in uh, physical phenotypes. When a drug is released or a medical therapy is released to the market, you will see even wider uh, heterogeneity or this drug will encounter wider heterogeneity. So the big question the drug development uh, industry and also regulators need to face is who, what and why will explain, for example, an adverse or outcome. So the therapies, the first thing they need to be is safe. But very often you will see in the news, not very often, but sometimes you will see in the news that the therapy has led to some adverse outcomes. How do you uh, predict whether, whether a drug is going to be safe very early on in the drug development chain? So the later you predict or you, uh, you determine that this drug is unsafe, the more money you have spent in, the, in this medicine that is not going to provide any benefits, but also can be harm harmful for the population. So we need very, very good techniques that allow us to assess whether a therapy is safe or not really early on in drug development. Of course, our premise is that you can use modeling and simulation for that in a very cheap and effective way. The first thing you have seen probably in this summer school is how to deal with anatomical variability. So if you're assessing a therapy for bones, for example, you will be using imaging for that lungs, you will have seen uh, uh, the work by, by Marin, for example, in assessing variability in, in this context. So other people are, of course, also doing this. Pablo and others are using 
clinical MRI to assess anatomical variability, for example, in the heart, which is the focus of our investigations. And this is conceptually the easy concept, right? The easy way to understand variability. We are all different, we can be imaged, and that anatomical variability can be implemented in our models to understand the its, its consequences functionally. I'm going to give you an example, which is the use of multi-scale modeling and simulation to understand how differences in the heart and the torso explain this functional signal, the electrocardiogram, or differences in the electrocardiogram. So this is a very basic question. If our heart is, uh, if our heart is different or has a very different orientation in our torso, how does that impact the electrocardiogram? So for that, we segment the MRI images, we construct anatomical meshes, like the one you see here. We embed some function functional modeling, so some equations and some simulations, and we can derive here uh, the electrical signal for different scenarios. In order to help you uh, follow through my, my lecture today, I will show you this slide that summarizes what our multi-scale models are about. So the first thing is they are multi-scale model models that represent the electrical activity of the heart from the ionic channel level, or the ionic current level, to be more precise, to the whole organ level. At the whole organ, you have seen that we can obtain MRI images from uh, patients and construct anatomical meshes that will allow us to simulate the whole organ electrical activity. At the at subcellular level, what we represent is the ionic currents that flow through the membrane of each of the cells. And these have been characterized using experiments in human cardiomyocytes, in human cells. Each of these ionic currents is representing the current that flows from a, uh, through a certain uh, type of channels. And this information at the ionic level is translated into equations like this, that is uh, just applying the OMLU current conductance and uh, transmembrane potential. So it's a bit more complicated because these ionic currents open and close in a specific manner to allow for the electrical activity of the heart to, uh, to function in a particular way. So these terms here are quite nonlinear, they are ordinary differential equations uh, when, when we put them together at the cell level, and, um, and they, they are a bit more complicated than just the OMLU. But just as a general uh, rule, what we are doing is collect experimental data for each of the ionic currents that flow through the membrane, and you have here uh, a uh, representation of how many of these uh, ionic currents we have. Uh, we put them together to simulate the cellular action potential, so this is the electrical signal that each of the cells generate when they are contracting. We have at the cellular level uh, a system of ordinary differential equations uh, when we put together these currents to simulate this signal here. And then at the ionic, at the whole organ level, each of the uh, uh, elements here of this heart would be uh, related to this electrical excitation, and then through these equations here or others, we can simulate the spread of the electrical excitation. So this is what we do uh, when we are simulating the electrocardiogram from the ionic current level to the whole organ. Um, so it's quite a complicated system, and uh, one of the important things is that this sodium current in particular is very stiff. So we need very small elements here to simulate the electrical excitation and for the numerical methods to converge. So this is computationally very demanding, and that's why we have a certain number of simplifications of the equations to simulate the electrical excitation at, at the whole organ level. Um, we have developed as a community a number of cellular models of uh, electrical excitation for the cardiac cells, including human, and many of them are uh, in this repository CellML. So the community has made a huge effort, and, and this has been supported very much by Oakland, in, in 
developing models that can be shared and, therefore, and that are uh, 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 fully available. I will be speaking later uh, about a particular one that is now considered for regulatory use. So this field started in 1960 with Dennis Noble, and I like to talk about Dennis Noble because I think it's a really interesting story. Dennis Noble was a PhD student, as many of you. He was a physiologist, and he was living in a time where computers were not available, 1960. And he, as a physiologist, as a biologist, he was the first one to develop a cardiac model of a, a, a mathematical model of a cardiac excitation. So I think it's really interesting because when I encounter biomedical scientists now, they hate mathematical modeling. They have a fear of it. So something has happened from the 1960s to now where there's been a complete divergence in career paths. And biomedical scientists are really skeptical and really don't know very much about modeling and simulation. And you guys, I don't know how many of you are doing experiments at the moment. But there's been a divergence that is not helping the field. In physics, it's a bit different. And I think physicists are more used to doing both theory and experiments. And I think it's really important for everybody to converge a little bit more. But it was Dennis Noble as a physicist who hadn't used any computers at the time who had to convince the UCL department to let him develop the first computer model that, that started the field. So this is, this is the multi-scale modeling framework. And actually, another, another important reflection about it is that when we describe these models, we talk about cardiac models. But this is simulation science. So what I'm not speaking about today is how these models are converted into numerical or are, are embedded in numerical schemes that allow for the simulations to happen. And simulation science is becoming a science per se. I, I also encounter lots of mathematicians, for example, who are not used to uh, this modeling and simulation and describe simulation science as just taking a model off the shelf and pushing a button. I've encountered that quite a lot in my career. So it, we need to make a better um, marketing, a better explanation of what simulation science is about, really, because otherwise people don't understand the complexities of, of this science. So when we put together these anatomical models that I was describing before, that come from patient-specific images with the uh, mathematical models and simulation schemes that I spoke in, uh, about in my previous slide, we can simulate the electrocardiogram. So this is the extracellular potentials on the torso, and you all know about it. So we simulate the ionic currents up to the whole organ using those equations. And what we can do with these models is to simulate what it does the, the uh, electrical signal look like when we rotate the heart or when we move it in the torso. So we're going from patient-specific to using these patient-specific models as an instrument to really understand what's going on when we, when, when we, when we uh, perturb the system in a very controlled way. I won't speak about the specifics about, uh, of this, but what, what this allows us to tease out is which of the leads, for example, which of the positions in the torso lead to certain, uh, experience certain changes when we are rotating the heart in specific ways. So this is another example when we, are, we can change the heart volume, for example, and we see that changing the heart volume uh, expands the signal temporarily, so it becomes wider. Sorry. Ah. So, uh, just a, 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 a conceptual, a conceptual uh, point here that I think is really important because it informs uh, many aspects of our practice in simulation science. So, the example of, uh, that I have given in terms of how multi patient specific multi scale models allow us to um, understand better how. Uh, the, the anatomi anatomical variability is translated into variability in functional signals. I think it's a good example of the two aspects of multi-scale modeling and simulation. So when we describe models, very often we say they are simplified representations of reality. 
And we talk about representations because we are focusing on what happens when we uh, construct these models. We take some experimental data, we take some clinical data, and we construct either equations or anatomical models that represent those data or those, uh, experiment, uh, those experimental or clinical recordings. So in the definition, we very often focus on models as representations. However, what we're doing is using the models as tools for discovery. And this is the part where I think we have the biggest impact. It's not simply in the representation of the experimental or clinical data, but it's very much on how we use these tools for discovery. And when we use the tools for discovery, we very often get away from the representation. So, I, and I'll, I'll speak at the end why I think this is really important. The example of the models I was presenting before. We start from them being representations of the clinical data in the sense that we take the anatomy from specific patients, right? But then we rotate those models and we perturb them in ways where they, they are no longer representations of those images that we were using at the beginning. And that's how we, we get new knowledge, by perturbing them and using them as tools that do have a representational aspect of it. We have based those models uh, uh, on clinical data, but then we have perturbed them in the way that they are no longer representations. And this theme of uh, models being representations and tools is really important in our practice, and I'll show you why. And very importantly, in how we we validate these models in the aspect of validation and what we think would be a valid model when we are taking these aspects into consideration. I'm, I'm happy to be interrupted, by the way. I, I think it'll be a nice uh, one and a half hour if I'm interrupted. So, when we talk about variability, and population heterogeneity. I think the easier conceptual aspect is anatomical variability because it can usually be obtained from non-invasive methods like imaging. In, a, in my field, in the heart, what is really challenging is functional variability. So the heart is constantly moving in terms of um, its composition. And it's really difficult to understand how this functional variability can be modeled or how we can use multi-scale modeling and simulation to understand this functional variability. I'll explain a little bit more. So I've shown you the clinical images, so we can obtain information from the patients in terms of these clinical images. We can construct anatomical models, and then we plug in equations that allow us to simulate the subcellular mechanisms. And for each of the cells in the heart, we are trying to simulate this action potential, so the electrical excitation in the cells that leads to contraction because the calcium comes in. And that is driven by a lot of different proteins and ionic currents where the, the flow of ions is happening. And what is really hard is that these currents are very different from one cell to another. They are very different from each of you. You would have a very different genetic background but also they are influenced by environmental factors, and I'll speak more about it. It is impossible to obtain this information from a patient, impossible, and even if we were able to obtain that information for a patient in one particular moment, those currents would, uh, would have changed immediately after. So, in this context, how can we predict whether a drug is going to be safe or not for that particular patient and that particular heart over the years? It's very hard trying to represent the heart of each, patients, uh, of each patient at that particular moment would be also really useless. So this is what I've uh, described before. And in terms of mathematics, what this means is that for each person, each cell, the parameters in our model would vary dynamically over the years in a way we cannot control and we cannot measure. So conductances for these ionic currents would vary in many different ways. And this is a problem we were facing when trying to understand how we can help with drug safety. So these currents vary due to genetic background and also to disease conditions. So we know because of uh, a lot of um, studies that 
people who have a certain genetic background, certain mutations, or people who have, for example, disease conditions like coronary artery disease are at higher risk of developing adverse outcomes due to drugs. In, in, in summary, if you're sick and you take a medicine, you are more likely to experience an adverse event. If you're healthy, then your heart is stronger and can take more perturbations. This is the reason why, for example, pediatric oncology, I'm told, has been really successful because they realize that kids, children, can take very high doses of chemotherapy, for example. Their hearts are very robust against really, really um, uh, toxic drugs. But as you age, your heart becomes more vulnerable and you can experience ad adverse effects with uh, medicines that, for example, there were um, cases with an antihistaminic of, of cardiac death. So we know that. We know that disease and genetic background is really important in population heterogeneity for drug safety. But what makes the problem even more complicated is that the heart and these ionic currents that I was showing you before, those parameters, change with things like circadian rhythms. So day and night, our heart is experiencing differences in ionic currents. So there, is a, there was a paper in Nature in 2002 that was showing how the ionic currents in the heart were fluctuating and the QT interval is fluctuating during day and night. The, the food you take will, will determine whether uh, the concentration of the drug is higher or lower, and specifically, grapefruit juice is really bad for you if you're taking any medicine, because it would change the metabolism of the drug and would change the concentration you're seeing, and this has been linked with sudden cardiac death. Hormones, and importantly, not only female hormones, which is always the, the topic of many investigations, but testosterone, for example, leads to a modulation of a very particular current that is very important. So our bodies are constantly changing, and our bodies are constantly changing in the way we cannot measure and we cannot simulate, uh, and that determines how the drug would affect our heart. So the problem is not only who is going to experience an adverse effect, but it is also when and due to what. So it's a very complicated uh, problem. If we want to take the view of we're going to build models that are a representation of the population heterogeneity with all these factors, this is an intractable problem. We cannot do it. But can we use multi-scale models as tools that allow us to understand what would happen when we have a wide variability in the parameters? And that's the route we took. So this is um, an example of experimental recordings. The red traces are experimental recordings in, in tissue, in human ventricular tissue from donor hearts. And we did that in collaboration with, so the, the experimental data are coming from Seged. Uh, in Hungary because they had access to human tissue because their the, the, the system for transplant of organs wasn't so well developed, so they were getting this, uh, uh, the, these hearts for experimentation. And what you see in the red traces is this action potential, so again, is the electrical uh, signal generated by cardiomyocytes in different tissues, um, and you can see a, a wide variability in the recordings. So when, I, when we first started with this work, which was in 2012, 2013, people were saying this variability cannot be there. It's due to experimental, uh, experimental noise or experimental error. And the biologists were really skeptical about this variability because if you read bio, bio, uh, biological papers, physiological papers, you will see that variability is bad in the papers in the practice, because what they always want is to show statistical significance, st statistical significance in the differences between two signals. So every time they have variability in the signals, they consider it to be a bad thing because it prevents them from reaching uh, statistical significance. So what, what they're doing in biology is try to prevent the signals to be variable which is exactly the opposite we should be doing to try to understand clinical viability. So there is a disconnect. So what we did is we were, we were having 
the skepticism in between different labs. So we were showing these these signals, these uh, recordings to other labs, and they were saying, "Oh, but this is experimental noise." So we said. Can you give us your data and we will analyze them in the same way to see whether you have the same experimental viability. And they, they, sometimes they were skeptical, they didn't want to share the data with us because that they were scared that we would show that they also had this experimental viability and that's perceived to be a negative thing in experimental science. But we, we, we built the trust, which is very important in collaborations, to, to, to acquire data from a number of uh, labs. And we, we talk, this, this is a number of the papers we wrote with them using a similar technique, but the, the idea was getting data from different labs, from different techniques, and showing that that viability in experimental recordings of human cardiomyocytes was always there. So it's not an artifact necessarily of a particular lab, but it can be representative of the viability we see in different hearts, in different cells, and we explain why. So what we did in terms of modeling and simulation is to move away from a single um, so if you, if you see in this, in this slide, so what we had in the field before was that everybody was simulating a single cardiomyocyte, and this single action potential was representative of a cell type. And that was th what the field was doing uh, over many years, over 50 years. Everybody was using a single model for a single uh, cardiomyocyte that was supposed to be an average behavior of that cell type. But by looking at these experimental traces, we thought we, we could change the paradigm and we could move from that uh, single trace to populations of models, to populations of cells. So Oli Britton, uh, as a PhD student in my lab, came up with this idea of using populations of models that had the same model underlying the same equations uh, underlying the uh, representation of the ionic currents, but the parameters in this model were changed randomly using Latin hypercube sampling. So I won't go into details, the, the details are in the paper, but it was a changing of, of thinking from using a generic model to using populations of models in which the parameters in the model were varied in a very wide range. So interestingly, this work led to very interesting discussions about what these models represent. So some people understood our work as we are trying to obtain models that represent exactly the cells we were measuring in the experiments. So if you take a, represent a representational view of the models, you have 62 experimental recordings, and some people were thinking what we were trying to do is construct a population of models that represented those 62 cells. And that's a representational view. And for that, you need to focus on inference techniques, trying to infer and also um, identifiability of the parameters. With these data, can you obtain models that that, that represent exactly this, uh, the, where these parameters are exactly the ones that you have in those experimental cells. So that's the representational view, and it leads to inference and identifiability techniques uh, to be used in this problem. What we wanted to do is something different. We wanted to say, if we construct a population of models that mimics the variability we have on the action potential, uh, at the action potential level, but that has very wide variability in the ionic properties, perhaps this can be a good model for drug safety evaluation. If, if the ionic parameters have a sufficiently wide range in which we can uh, simulate a many, many, many wide, many, 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 many different scenarios, perhaps this is going to be predictive of how a drug might or might not develop adverse effects in the wide population. Is this clear? So one is a representational view, where you are just looking at how these cells, how these models can represent these 62 specific experiments. 
And what we wanted to do is use them as tools that had a representational aspect of it. So we wanted still the action potentials to s look very similar to the ones in the experiments. But we didn't, we didn't want them to represent those 62 cells. We wanted to, uh, them to represent hundreds of thousands of pot potential scenarios, a thousand potential scenarios. So we wanted to augment through simulation what can be done experimentally. So experimentally, you can only do 62. Through simulations, we can have thousands and then use them as tools. And we don't care whether they represent, in fact, we don't want them to represent those 62 tools, uh, 62 cells. We want uh, them to represent many more scenarios. So, Pablo. So, yes, so th there was a calibration step. So we generated hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands, depending on the project, of potential models. And then we only retain the ones that gave us a physiological action potential. So there was an experimental calibration in there. Whether or not, so we knew the action potentials or these signals were, were plausible were similar to the ones that were seen in the experiments. We didn't know whether each of the models that we retained is representing a cell in the in a cardiomyocyte in the world or not. So there was a calibration step that allowed us to say, that, yeah, these action potentials are plausible. They have a shape and characteristics that look like in the experiments. We didn't know whether these all the scenarios we were um, considering were scenarios that were present in the human population at any given time. Okay? Yes. So th that's a really interesting question. So we did that at the end, and I'll show you how. So we could, we could have done it that way. So we could have, and we did it in some studies. We said, we're going to con construct a population of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cells. So we could have done that. What we did here is to just write, um, vary the parameters in a very wide range. And in, those, in that, in that population of cells, we would have cells representing a sodium mutation that leads to a decrease in the sodium current or a, a ischemic patient that have a lower sodium potassium pump. But we didn't do it explicitly. We just did it in the way we varied the parameters. We knew some of them were pl plausible. In fact, it's interesting because we, uh, I'll show you later the, the, um, the, the results, but, but one of the things that happened is that we saw that some of the cells had that were experiencing loads of adverse outcomes, lots of abnormalities, had a very low IK1 current. So one of the particular potassium currents were, was extremely low in some of the cells that were experiencing really weird behavior. And we thought this is unphysiological. You know, it cannot be that somebody is living with this parameter being so low. But in fact, we searched the literature, or rather Elisa Passini did, and she saw that there were patients that had a very rare mutation affecting that particular current that were living with loads of problems and also arrhythmic events. So what uh, after the years, so what my feeling is that there are many more possibilities in the human population that we are considering in our model. So initially, we were thinking, you know, the question was, is this really possible to have this array of variability in the human population? I think we're going very far. And over the years, looking at the literature and at the results we're getting, I think the variability is even wider than we were considering. And the reason why people are not dropping dead, even though we have this variability, is because the heart and also the, the, the other organs have ways of suppressing this variability. 
In the heart, for example, it's cellular coupling. Cellular coupling suppresses a lot of the, of the potential adverse outcomes. It, it's only when coupling is, is interfered with, like in infarction, for example, or other diseases, that this variability can create heterogeneity in the heart and, and lead to, to problems. So my feeling is, at the beginning, we were very, very modest in our perturbation of the, of the parameters, and we were going for 30% 30, 30 variation, now I think the variation is much wider when we are considering pathologies and, and mutations. But I'll, I'll link back to clinical trials in a bit. So what we did with this is to go from being able to simulate the response of a cell to uh, a drug application. In this case, it's flecainide, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so this was the, what we were doing in the field a few years back. So we have a healthy cell, we have a cell with a drug, and this is the uh, behavior we expect. And what we did is to change the paradigm by using models and focus rather on identification of parameters or parameter inference to trying to explain differences in phenotype. So if we have this very wide population of cells and we don't care whether these parameters in the model represent any particular cell in our experiments, in fact, we don't want them to, can we explain different phenotypes and if some of the cells represent uh, this behavior, some of the cells experience these abnormalities which are linked to adverse outcomes or these ones, what makes them different? Can we learn from this in terms of um, uh, differences in the populations? What we were able to do with this is in fact in silico drug trials. So if we have a drug and the pharma companies are uh, acquiring some data on how the drug affects certain proteins in the heart. We plug that in our simulations and we can predict what would be the change in, in this case, uh, one of the biomarkers when we apply the drug at different doses. So we can see here that this particular drug leads to a prolongation of the action potential duration and at high doses it leads to abnormalities. So this started with a, a collaboration with Janssen, and in fact the whole idea of populations of models started with a collaboration with Janssen's Pharmaceutica, so our collaborators in industry, where we were talking quite a lot about validation. We were talking quite a lot about they have some experimental data, we have a simulation, how can we compare to, to know that we trust the model. And the, this idea of populations of models was created through that collaboration, where we, they were really pushing us hard in the credibility of the models. And we were looking at this wide range of variability in experimental data and our single traces and saying, how can we actually compare that? And that, that intersectoral collaboration with industry is what led to this new paradigm. So um, we, we started with validating the models in different ways. And one of the things we had to do uh, in, in, in this collaboration to convince them that they could use modeling and simulation in drug development was to compare the outcome of our simulations, which is here, to some of the experimental data they are using in drug development. So most of the team in pharma drug safety has always been experimental people. They have no experience with modeling and simulation. In fact, we had a project with, uh, that involved GSK, and it was, a, <laughs> it was a, um, a European project, and we were all very excited. A lot of companies were involved, and GSK, one of the big pharma, was involved in the project. And as we were starting the project that was funded, the whole computational biology team was fired from the company. So that happens in industry quite a lot. So they, were, they, they, they had dedicated modeling and simulation teams and now they have, so, some, some companies have them, so AstraZeneca, for example, has one. Um, but not all the companies had experience with this type of modeling and simulation. So when we were, when we are collaborating, now things that have changed a little bit, when we were collaborating with industry, their experience was in experimental methods. And they were much more keen in in vitro methods and experimental methods, in vivo methods, than in modeling and simulation. So in the collaboration, there was a component of modeling and simulation, technical work, but another component of building trust and explaining what this modeling and simulation can do. And I can speak more about it. So a first step was 
comparing the simulations to the experiments and showing that they, they, they show the same things, but also they have added value. And uh, another thing that happened at the same time, maybe we need a... Another thing that happened at the same time as Oli was doing, uh, was doing his PhD and generated this idea of populations of models and we were uh, collaborating with Janssen, is that the FDA, the US Food and Drug Administration, and is specifically the, the body that uh, approves the drugs to be released to the market, changed the paradigm or announced that they were going to change the paradigm uh, of um, drug, drug assessment in the FDA. So in July 2013, I went to Washington as, a, as an expert for this uh, in uh, CIPA initiative, is what we call it. So it, it was called CIPA initi initiative. And what the FDA and industry were proposing is to change the first clinical trial uh, for safety, so when the drug is delivered to healthy volunteers, to change it through a combination or by a combination of modeling and simulation, so an in silico assay, and some in vitro technologies that were using stem cell derived cardiomyocyte. So in terms of a shift, this was a huge shift. So they were really pr proposing to change a clinical study in healthy volunteers by a combination of modeling and simulation, as I've shown you before, and an experiment in stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. So experimental and in silico. So I went to Washington in July 2013 with my third baby because I was on maternity leave, so it was quite an interesting experience. But the, the, the reason I, wa I went is because it was quite a historical moment, right? So the FDA for the first time was pushing for this to happen. And they announced this in one meeting, and the day after, we had a, an expert meeting to see whether this was feasible. So this was a, another interesting experience for me. I would have done it the other way around. I would have said, is this possible to the experts? If we do it, how do we do it? And do a very careful analysis of whether this can be done. And they chose to do it differently. They chose to announce it, we're going to do this and then start working through the process. So why they did it that way is because probably if they don't push it, it doesn't happen. So they, their first estimate is that this would be implemented in 2015. Do you think it has happened? So it hasn't happened yet. But the reason why I think they did it this way is because it really shaked the pharmaceutical industry. And they, they really announced it, they said this is gonna happen, and if the FDA says this is gonna happen, then people need to take it very seriously. So it created a lot of interest from pharmaceutical industry, which of course benefited us, if, or, or a lot of academics actually, that engaged in that process. So it hasn't happened yet, but we've made a lot of progress, and I'll show you what type of progress this has made. So one of the things we did is to create a consortium. Uh, it, was, it is funded by the National Center for the Three Eyes of Animals in Research, because another important push is to use this mod modeling and simulation to replace animal testing. And uh, this is something I lead in Oxford, and everybody is welcome to attend. We'll have another meeting probably next year. But the idea was to bring together academia, industry, clinicians, and regulators to really push this idea of in silico testing for cardiotoxicity. And one of the things we did is to work with different pharmaceutical companies to try to assess how good our populations of models are in predicting drug, drug uh, safety. So this is our software. So this is a population of uh, simulations using a population of thousands of cells in silico, very similar to the one I've shown you before. So the model is the same one, or the structure of the model is the same one, and the difference between these different traces is that the models have a slightly different or very different set of parameters. And then from pharmaceutical industry, what we get is the information of how the drug affects the different ion channels. So basically, the, the, the drug can affect the sodium, the calcium, the potassium channels, 
and we have information uh, that is the input to our models and our simulations. We input that and we perform in silico drug trials. So we ask the question, uh, is the response of all the cells healthy or is the response of some of the cells abnormal? And we count how many cells develop abnormalities and that determines whether we predict the drug is going to be safe or risky. Okay? And initially we did it with Janssen and then we've started to do it with a number of companies because they don't believe in a single paper. <coughs> Sorry. So my experience is that even if the evidence is there, they won't necessarily believe the evidence unless they have reproduced the evidence themselves with their own data. So we have been working with each of the companies in performing those credibility studies. But more than that, my experience was that if we were the only ones who were able to do this, they wouldn't believe it either. So what we did <coughs> is to create a software that was very easy to use. So this was from the academic software that the PhD student Oli Britton did. We, um, Oxford has a fund for innovation and we developed a software that was very easy to use in Microsoft computers, which is what they use in, co in companies. So we, we teamed up with them and we asked them for the requirements of a software they would be able to use in their companies. And we translated the academic software into a tool that was really fulfilling the requirements of industry. And we got funding to work on this from different places. They also funded some of it, but we wanted to keep it independent from the companies. So the work we've done with the companies and the work we've been doing to promote this modeling and simulation for drug testing has not only been we publish the paper and it's fine. We have really worked with them in trying to break through some of the barriers that would uh, prevent um, these, these new technologies to break through in pharma. So Elisa Passini, who, who is a, a senior postdoc in my group, what uh, she did in this paper was to demonstrate that human in silico drug trials have a higher accuracy than animal models in predicting uh, uh, arrhythmic cardiotoxicity. So I using the framework I showed you before and the software that we, uh, we developed with pharma companies, what she did is to take information on 55 drugs, plug that in the simulations, look at how many drugs, how many repolarization abnormalities or how many cells would develop these repolarization abnormalities for each of the drugs and compare that to the known in vivo risk of these compounds. So for this study, we had to deal with drugs that had already been released to the market and that had shown this uh, arrhythmic risk to be present. And this was the validation. So what we obtained with this is that the accuracy of the model or the simulations, the populations of models in predicting which drugs were safe, which drugs was risky, was about 90%. And this was quite high compared to animal models. So usually these uh, pharmaceutical companies are using rats, guinea pigs, to test these drugs, and those are very different to uh, the human population. But more importantly, the animals they are using, which also involve uh, dogs, are healthy. So this is, again, very different to what's happening in the, uh, in the broad population where people who experience these adverse outcomes are, are sick. So no, no surprise that our populations of models were able to detect these abnormalities uh, uh, with higher, sen uh, higher accuracy. We, in fact, were able not only to predict, which is something that machine learning probably can do very well, but we were able to explain why certain, certain subpopulations would experience uh, higher arrhythmic risk than other subpopulations. So we analyzed the differences between the different uh, responses or the different phenotypes or we analyzed the differences in the models that were showing different, different phenotypes, and we identified that those that were 
uh, leading to repolarization abnormalities had, for example, a lower sodium potassium pump. And this was what ha the, this lower sodium potassium pump is known to be related to ischemic disease, heart failure, and infarction. So we would have been able to predict the CAS clinical trial, for example, that was showing that uh, sodium blockers were uh, were dangerous in people who have coronary artery disease, for example. So Talol is an another example. So I think what is very important is that not only we were able to predict which just drugs were safe or not, but we were also to, uh, able to explain why certain subpopulations were at higher risk. And this is also very important because, because it can lead to useful drugs for certain populations uh, not to be discarded completely. So if you understand why a certain subpopulation is at, at high, high risk, perhaps it's important to not give it to that population, but give it to another population that would uh, benefit from it. So not only we were able to predict, but also to explain which is the role of multiscale modeling and simulation. So I think I'm going to have to speed up. OK, so this is work um, by, um, by Hector, um, and who is in the audience here. And what I wanted to show you is that in, in pharma, we, were, we had to deal with uh, very easy to use technology. So the software we developed for them was uh, a software that can run in a desktop. But what we're doing in terms of research is to also link to clinical uh, signals, like the electrocardiogram, because that's important for another world that is the clinical world. So in this uh, slide that Hector um, has produced, we are showing how we can simulate the effect of drugs on ischemic hearts. And this is important because we can link it to um, arrhythmic ri risk. So we can simulate arrhythmias, like in this movie here, and link and explain arrhythmic risk in whole o at whole organ level taking into account the effect of drugs and disease at the ionic level. So this has led to new concepts in physiology, like the idea that the, the drug-induced arrhythmias are caused by early after depolarization uh, in the ischemic border zone. So we, we have different uh, streams of work depending on what is the potential impact that this can generate. So if it's potential impact in pharma, then it needs to be easy to use. It needs to be uh, something they can use in-house because the, 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 the level of um, safety in terms of data transfer needs to be very high. But in terms of research and in terms of clinical impact, it's important to link with clinical, uh, clinical signals and clinical data the clinicians are, uh, are able to um, relate to. So, so, uh, so, so this is quite important for for our research and how we design the potential impact. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Certain set of uh, it's based on certain set of parameter, and uh, like certain set of uh, cell model it assume. So when you change your parameter to like uh, very different from what they're doing in their experiment originally, uh, the tissue model probably has a bit of very like it, it needs to adjust to the new scenario as well. So I wonder if you have done some study to also to see if your after you change the parameter, the tissue model or like higher level model can still fit the uh, fit the purpose of the research. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I mean, it's a good question. So so the first in terms of the translating from cellular variability to tissue model, we've done several things. Mm. So one, the first one is to say, do we need to incorporate this random variability in a tissue model? So does each of the cells need to be different in the tissue model or not? So, if the, so what we saw is that 
the coupling of the cells is so strong that if you have heterogeneity in the tissue, then it gets suppressed by the coupling. So it doesn't really matter whether you have in healthy conditions, whether you have a, a wide range of variability or not, because the it will be suppressed by a tissue coupling. So that's the first good news. The second one what we've done is to check whether the, the whether for all the models the when you we vary for example the sodium current whether we would have propagation so you can have very low sodium current at single cell and still have an action potential but when you put it in tissue then it wouldn't propagate so what we've done with we've done populations of tissue of tissue uh, with uh, to 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 quantify conduction velocity and other parameters like refractoriness so we have done that and also in, in some studies, we have calibrated against it. So we have the single cell calibration. We throw away models that wouldn't fulfill the criteria in terms of action potential and other things. And then we have done tissue simulations to also calibrate for conduction velocity, for example. In terms of populations of whole organ, that's the difficulty because we don't have computer power for it. So you need to go through the, f the steps before and then select the scenarios. So what we've done is select representative examples of different scenarios for the whole organ level. So if you, ha if you see, for example, at cel cellular or tissue level that certain models yield a very interesting phenotype, then you select a representative of that for the whole organ. Unless we have really fast methods, so we, we, we will be developing that, I hope. Uh, another question is like more mass uh, related, because uh, I uh, the if it is go uh, beyond tissue level, like organ level, is the partial differential equation. So that is quite hard to study. Like changing parameter mm. will have what sort of impact theoretically. Yeah. So you may in encounter some like, uh, for example, bifurcation that will change uh, just like slightly. It will go into completely different behavior. Yeah. So I think uh, that kind of study will also be very interesting. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I think when you start, it's almost like freeing yourself from parameter inference and trying to say, okay, I it's also the frustration of the, I won't be able to have enough information from my data to actually represent this patient, for example. And, and you move away from that and you say, okay, how can my model be useful in this context? And then you, you get to explore variability in another way that is not necessarily all patient specific, but that deal deals with that variability, then you have a lot of very interesting combinations of studies you can do. Okay, thank you. And actually, um, I always think about this from a clinical point of view, because um, in hospital, if, for example, imagine that you use the, the Josin or the amiodarone, mm -hmm. so it always takes several days mm -hmm. for the uh, toxicity to mm -hmm. be developed. So um, the drug con concentration in the blood needs to be accumulated. Mm -hmm. So um, is it also possible to adjust parameters mm -hmm. in your model to see something like that? Or do you consider time in your uh, model? Yeah, no, that's a very interesting question. Uh, in fact, because the, the 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 information they get from in in drug development is is a static value of how much the drug changes the ion, the ionic current. It doesn't take into account any of that. You know how how things vary, how the metabolism of the of the of the drug would change depending on the patient. So we we don't we don't use that because we don't have data for that. And even if we were able to get it clinically, then it wouldn't be feasible in drug development, if you know what I mean. But in terms of the in terms of the understanding you get from the models, I think it's a very Im important one because you can vary the, the drug concentration quite a lot. And then you can try to explain whether with the clinical information you get, the, the patient may be more vulnerable later than bef you know at early stages. So this is another interesting point. In fact, another important point is that the information you get with the same drug, on the same drug by different companies is different, especially for the calcium current. So the difference in measurement of that value you enter in the model can be a hundredfold, depending on the technique they've used. Or so there is a lot of 
uncertainty, but uncertainty that is also variability, and those are very different concepts. And, and that needs to be uh, taken into account when you differentiate between representations and, and tools in terms of models. So I think it's a very interesting point. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, so two questions. Uh, first, regarding the PF. So in your model, you don't have any... Um, you have the uh, mic. Like in your model, you don't have any uh, variability of your, your tissue properties, properties spatially? Because you said you didn't have you uh, like heterogeneity as random heterogeneity. So we've we've run simulations with run. Is that your question, or do you want to ask the question? No. It is that. So, so in we have run some simulations of random heterogeneity, and under healthy coupling conditions, it was completely suppressed. So you would have like a very homogeneous action potential duration. We have heterogeneity in terms of transmural heterogeneity, apex-based heterogeneity. And what we have chosen to do is, rather than um, a random heterogeneity in the model, conduct studies when you have, if you have an action potential duration that is short, this is what happens. If you have a model with an action potential duration that is long, this is what happens. So rather than a random one that you cannot, we mm. cannot do because we don't have enough computational resources, we explore scenarios that we think are going to yield to a an interesting phenotype in more depth, but without having a heterogeneity that is random in all the cells. Does that answer? Yeah. 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 Thanks. Uh, and sorry, one, one <laughs> question uh, regarding the, the ECG signals you yeah. showed with your like your simplified model for clinical purposes. Do you use, um, so you don't incorporate the, the torso geometry there? Because how do you recover the, the ECG? And no, we do incorporate the you torso. Do? Okay, okay. And it's patient specific. Okay, okay. thanks. Hi. Uh, as somebody who is doing the EC measurements, so I wonder from the pharma, do you get only IC50 and H, or do you get the original traces? So for the drugs. For, th for the drugs and how do they interfere with the channels. I mean, L-type channel, you could measure it different ways. Yep. It will in impact your measurements. Yep. So I do wonder whether you look on the variability of their measurement. Yeah. So so the, there is, so we, we, because we work with different pharma, we see the variability in the IC50 values. And we had a study with uh, Merck that was showing an was showing the impact of having different values for the IC50 values in the predictions. So th th there are two, two points to your answer. One is what we have chosen to do is to say, if, if we have different measurements, what would that mean in terms of the predictions? So do we still get the same classification of the drug even though the values we get as input are very different? So in the paper by Elisa, we had drug a certain for a certain drug we have one two three simulations so if we had one two three values for the ic50s coming with different methods we perform the simulations as if they were different drugs and if the prediction was still the same in terms of safe or risky we didn't care if the prediction was different then you need you have a problem uh, the pharma has a, a problem okay so they are very much looking into the the um, the methods for uh, ionic channel drug interactions. And they are going to uh, provide standards for it and, and everything. The, there is work by Gary Miram's group that was showing that the, if they were conducting the measurements several times, they were having different measurements for the IC50 values. And they came up with a very complicated way to input that in the, in the models you know, in terms of uncertainty quantification and stuff. We chose not to do it that way, we chose to simplify because that enabled a better collaboration with pharma and it wasn't necessary. So that's why, that's the, the two sides of my answer. Any, any more? Thanks a lot. I think this is the most useful part of the, in, of the presentation. Keep going in the questioning rate. And I'm gonna get more, more water. But, um, right, so, Let me see what I do. I'm, I'm just going to quickly mention this study because I, I think it's um, the future. 
not my study, but but the the, the merging machine learning and um, and the modeling and simulation. So I, I'll quickly go through this. Um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a is a disease. Uh, you all know very well in, in this city because people have been studying it. Um, it's a common genetic disease and it leads to a very heterogeneous phenotype. E ECG abnormalities are very common in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and, and uh, imaging has shown that the disease is characterized by a thickening of the muscle but also some fibrosis and some uh, structural abnormalities that now in Oxford are really famous because uh, Rina Riga, the cardiologist has, who's been working on it, has published another study on this, which is uh, really interesting. What we did in this study was starting with clinical data and we wanted to see whether from the clinical data and especially from the electrocardiogram, we could identify different subpopulations in the patient cohort. So this is the, the study database we had at the moment and the study was based on the ECG initially and blind to the ECG, we had this collection of clinical data and, and MRI, and also genotype data. But what Aurelion, who was a PhD student in my lab, who is now in Maastricht, did was to focus the analysis on the ECG and ask the question, if we analyze the ECG in a certain way, and I won't go in detail about it, uh, you can have a look at the papers, can we identify different uh, clusters of patients that have different uh, arrhythmic risk uh, scores? So this is the paper, this is Aurore and Anna and Rina, and it's an all-women tip, which was really good to have. Uh, anyway, so this is the, um, the, the, the setup of the study. You can have the details in the paper again, but we analyze the ECG. Then we do feature selection, cluster in algorithm, and from the information we get from the ECGs, we determine different subpopulations of patients. And then as a final step, we look at association with clinical risk mar mar markers for sudden cardiac death. So this is the result of the clustering analysis, looking at how, from the data, the, the clustering analysis could identify different clusters of equal size of, uh, in this patient cohort. And when we look at the, the clinical characteristics of these groups of patients, we saw that the ECG was different in those clusters and the first group here had a normal QRS, but an inverted T wave, whereas others had more abnormalities in QRS than this one. And group 1B had a normal ECG altogether. So what, uh, this is what the analysis of the data yielded. And then we looked at the images from these patients, and we, um, we saw that there was more apical hypertrophy in these patients than uh, in the others that shown septal hypertrophy. So what we also saw is that in terms of arrhythmic risk score, this group had the higher arrhythmic risk score, and it was interesting to see that was related to inverted T wave. So we did analysis of data, some clustering analysis, and that yielded some interesting um, groups of patients with different uh, clinical characteristics. But what we didn't know is what was the connection between the hypertrophy and the electrophysiological phenotype, and we didn't know whether this was going to be useful clinically either, uh, in part because we had uh, clinical scores but not real events because of the size of the of the database and the fact that they were low-risk patients. So there were still loads of unanswered questions. So what we did is to use multi-scale modeling and simulation to answer the question, why are those patients having these different phenotypes? What does it mean? Can we yield so much in some more information on these, on these phenotypes? So again, Aurore developed uh, models for, not for all the patients, not for all the 86 patients, but for representative uh, examples of each of the patient groups and developed anatomical models from the uh, MRI. And these anatomical models included both the heart and the torso. And you can see here some of the hypertrophy in these patients here and here. And uh, again, this one was the one that had higher hypertrophy. So using very similar methods to the ones I showed you before, what we did is develop these uh, finite element meshes. You can see here the representation. And then we included the electrophysiology in these models, as I've shown before. And we asked, we tested several hypotheses. 
So the first hypothesis was, can hypertrophy alone, or the fact that we have thicker ventricles in this patient, explain the ECG phenotype? The answer was no. So only with hypertrophy we couldn't explain this phenotype. Can changes in tissue microstructure explain the phenotype? So we had DTI, we included uh, areas of different conductivities and uh, a lot of different things, and the answer was no. So you can see that Aurore was very happy at the time that all her hypotheses were uh, uh, tested negative, so she wasn't able to explain the phenotype. Um, so she was very frustrated. <coughs> but she continued testing the hypothesis, and eventually what we saw is that the a disconnection between the what we our phenomenological Purkinje system and the myocytes was able to explain this phenotype. So it was primarily what we were showing in the model, and it could be that there are other explanations, but the only way we were able to recover the ECG from these patients was abnormalities in the conduction system. And there there are so there is some evidence uh, that this is uh, happening in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the T-wave abnormalities in our model were explained by a longer action potential duration. This is an example uh, of the simulations. A longer action potential duration in the area of hypertrophy, which is something that we know is also possible. So we use clustering analysis and uh, signal processing of the ECG to identify these different clusters of patients, and then multi-scale modeling and simulation to really explain, provide potential explanations for uh, those uh, phenotypes. This is something that still needs to be, uh, of course, validated clinically, so there are very various ways, various steps to validation, uh, and, and something that is complicated. But if we, our models are, or our simulations are proven to be credible, then there are these two different types of patients that will have Higher arrhythmic, higher arrhythmic risk, one that would be related to depolarization and conduction abnormalities, and the other that would be related to um, repolarization abnormalities, and the management would need to be different. And of course, we want to use these models for drug testing, um, and uh, Elisa Pacina co conducted a study on this, so this would enable in silico trials for specific types of patients. So just to summarize in this thesis of Orléans, what she did is to use clustering analysis to identify the patient phenotypes, but then the explanation came from modeling and simulation. And I think this is, this is where we can be really strong in the combination of different computational techniques, including predictions with machine learning, but then providing explanations with modeling and simulation. And that space is a very rich one for future research. So it's also an interesting space to talk about validations of models and what the models in machine learning and in modeling and simulation mean and how they can be validated. And that depends very much on whether they are representations of data or they are used to as tools and very m they are often hybrids. But the validation steps are really different in both cases. I think it's the conceptual framework is really interesting. And of course, if we understand models as tools, then we need to be very careful about how we're using them. So it's not just the representational aspects that need to be validated, but it's also how we use these tools and whether we need the perfect tool for a particular uh, type of question or whether approximations are always good. So there is also how useful the models can be, even if they are very imperfect, and we know that. So there is always a tension between representation, data availability, and the use of the models, and how we make use of that tension. So uh, in, in my work, it's been really important to collaborate with a philosopher of science, Anna Maria Carusi, and, and I would encourage you to, to read some of these papers, because this conceptual framework really informs validation. And validation is something we don't talk very much about. And in the combination of computational approaches, it's extremely important. Validation in machine learning means something different uh, than validation in multi-scale modeling and simulation. M validation, if you're talking about tools as representations, is different to validation if you're using tools as models, uh, models as tools. 
sorry. So in, in the work we did with Ana Maria, just to finish, uh, we really came up with a, a system, uh, which is the modeling simulation and experiment system, as the basis for validation. And there needs to be consistency in this system, if we're talking about validation in terms of representation, but it needs to be also related to what we want to investigate. And sometimes, very often, we have information from an experimental construct or an in vitro system, but we want to really uh, investigate an in vivo situation. So this validation of the modeling, simulation, and experiment system has really three steps. One is, is there consistency in terms of what I'm trying to represent? So I construct a model, I have some experiments, are they consistent? But then, is the, is the validation also independent in terms of uh, the, the, the questions I want to investigate? Or is the validation, is the model valid or is the model uh, useful to understand human in vivo electrophysiology, for example? So there is consistency in the system, but it, is this useful to understand, for example, a, a, a situation in humans? So the example is my populations of models. We don't care whether the populations of models represent, uh, we, we care about the populations of models represented some aspects of the experiments, but we want them to go beyond that and inform, provide information of what happens in vivo and not only remain in this experimental uh, system. But there is an additional validation that is, is this modeling and simulation system really useful clinically or for pharmaceutical industry? Is this providing an impact? So there are kind of different steps to validation if we, if we think about it. And in this paper, we, we analyzed these, these questions. But we didn't do, what we didn't do is how this modeling and simulation validation is related to machine learning validation, which is, again, a different thing. And I think it's, it's very much needed. And of course, this modeling and simulation experiment uh, system is also social. We do collaborate across sectors and we do collaborate in the disciplinary. And this creates also really interesting, uh, unique aspects to our research. So just to finish, I think human in silico trials uh, using multi-scale modeling are, are, uh, and simulation are becoming a, a really important part of therapy development and certainly in drug development there is a really uh, a good progress in the last five, six years, pushed very much by the Food and Drug Administration. I, I, I really think that understanding what we're doing from a, a conceptual uh, framework is very useful and, and the question of validation is really important. And, and something that needs uh, a lot of more depth. <coughs> we, we have shown that there is high accuracy in predicting and explaining drug-induced drug arrhythmias. I really think this is a solved issue. And there are other groups that have shown also very high accuracy different with different approaches. So we need to move forward to other topics, like, for example, contractility. This is something Francesca is doing, and we are really interested in doing in our group, so now we're moving to electromechanical models and really following all the steps for validation in this area. Our big strength in modeling and simulation is when we focus in human, because that's, uh, especially in our field, because that's not so something that can be done very easily in uh, drug development and therapy development, and also the fact that we can represent disease, and again, this is also something really difficult. Um, and understanding heterogeneity and viability requires diversity of people, expertise, and approaches. I've seen how people have made big mistakes in the way they were approaching the research because they didn't have a diverse team. They were all the same thing along the same lines. And that led to poor, uh, a poor set of ideas being developed really badly. So I think the idea of having very interdisciplinary, very diverse uh, groups of people really is very important to uh, uh, good research programs. And, and I would also encourage you to think about the three hours of animals in research, uh, reduction, replacement, and refinement of animals in research. We do have a, a big role to play in with modeling and simulation in this field. And the National Center in the UK has a prize that gives 30K, uh, 30,000 pounds, to a paper that promotes or shows good advancement of uh, 
uh, in this area. It's international, so it doesn't need to be a UK paper. But as a, as, a, as a junior researcher, it's a really good thing to have. So it really gives the first author this grant of 30, 30K. It includes 2,000 for you personally, and uh, the rest is a research grant. So it really can promote your research when, when, when you're quite junior. And two people in my group had it, uh, uh, Oli Britton and then uh, Elisa Passini. And, and really, I would encourage you to, to look into that. It's a really good thing to have. And with this, I just want to finish. Thank you very much for all the questions. And if you have any more, I'm happy to uh, answer. Thanks. Let's keep it going. <laughs> Thank you for the extremely interesting talk. I'm particularly interested in the populations of models and their applicability to other cell types. Because unlike cardiomyocyte, what we often have are population level data. Yep. So we can't really quantify the natural intercellular variability. So I was wondering if you have any thought of how it could be done. So so could be done in other, uh, other fields or? Yeah, th I field? was particularly thinking of cancer cells Cancer sure. cells and I, I mean the, these populations of models started in neuroscience. So we we took the idea from Eve Marder, uh, and she had a different types of diff completely different type of models. Um, and it's interesting that we we took the ideas from neuroscience and then apply it to uh, to cardiac cells, and then it's going back to neuroscience through another route. But also it has been applied to pancreatic cells, for example, and also biomechanical models. I think the concept is can be applied to anything. So as long as you have a good question and a, a, a solid criteria for calibration and then a, a use of the model that would benefit from exploring a parameter space and, and, and focusing on different phenotypes. So for example, you have any model and you want to understand whether the response to a drug or the response to a perturbation is going to be homogeneous in the whole population or not. So, so it, it, I, I really think the ideas are applicable to, to, to a, any type of model provided that that framework is, is really clear. It, it is also interesting how you, know, you can see whether by perturbing the, mo the parameters in, in a wide range, you can see bifurcation or you can see differences in pathway really and then and then go back and see what are the differences in those two trajectories of the models and whether and whether that means anything to you right so i i, I think it's it's an idea that was brilliant from eve and that can really change the frustration that we feel as modelers when we don't have enough data yeah, <laughs> yeah? Thank you very much for Hi this Bart. talk. Um, I really, really enjoy it that every time you come to this summer school, you manage to give another interesting talk with new aspects, and especially even more enthusiastic and very inspiring, I think, <laughs> for researchers. So thank you very much. We will invite you again, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> A pleasure. Uh, one thing, um, I mean, I like very, very much that you start from data, you investigate data, look at heterogeneity, and then find explanations by using, for example, modeling. I think that's how medical research should be done, and luckily it is being done more and more. So I very much enjoy that, and I think that's a way forward also, and then also starting from measurements and then finding ways to represent these and then use it in order to, to do new studies or new discoveries in some ways. Mm. I think really, Indeed, as you say, this is the way forward, and we have to convince people that this is the way that models could be used. Unfortunately, indeed, in the past, some people have represented it in a different way, and we now have to fight this. Mm. As you say, we need to get the confidence of industry, confidence mm. of medical doctors, and things like that. And now it's a little bit a philosophical, practical question for this type of research, because when you show these kind of super interesting data and you put a reference, very often you end up in journals like PLOS or Frontiers mm -hmm. or things like that, where many medical researchers would say like, they would really look down to this mm -hmm. type of journals. What is your opinion about this? Is this something 
that you target or something that you end up with and saying like, unfortunately, we cannot get into these journals, but it takes a long time in order, and this is the way we do it. So how do you see this and how do you deal with this as a junior researcher yeah. that you don't have nature papers, let's say it that way? So I think this is a, okay, so we, I, okay, <laughs> let me structure this. As a professor in Oxford with my track record, I don't care that much anymore about the journal, okay? Because I o I'm also very lucky in that I, uh, I'm, um, I am funded by the Wellcome Trust, and the Wellcome Trust has signed the DORA. The, 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 the do you know about DORA? No. So it's, it's um, a declaration of San Francisco, so signed in San Francisco, that people shouldn't be using impact factors for anything that is related to promotion, okay? So they are really, and a lot of institutions have signed this declaration. If your institution ha you you hasn't signed this declaration, then they should, um, where they are not using impact factor for anything that is related to promotion. Okay, and there is a, a big push for that. So when I sit in a, in a panel, a funding panel, I don't use that. So we are not allowed to use impact factor for anything that is evaluation of funding, blah, 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 okay? So now things are changing. Now, of course, we have, uh, am I being recorded? Yes. Okay. We, can, <laughs> we can cut it out if you wish to. So we want the truth. Okay, so so the the older generation still looks at impact factor quite a lot. So as a junior researcher, having a high impact paper a paper published in a high impact journal can still mean um, good things for you. So we, I always leave it to the type of work or the 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 first author. I say if you want to try you know, with imp high impact journals, then I'm happy to go for it. And it's gonna be a fight and it's gonna be long, but I'm happy to go for it. So that's how I do it. Now, my experience with editorial work is, so I, I'm losing respect for it, if, you, if that's, so I used to think that it was all about a, a fair evaluation of the paper, and it's not. And it's a random process, and getting funding is a random process, so, if the first author wants to fight it, then I'm really happy to go from one journal to another, and very often we get rejected, and we end up in frontiers with 12,000 reads, which I'm very happy with. So I in the case of the Frontiers paper with Elisa Passini and Jansen, I really wanted it published soon, because it was the right time to do it. So we, we did it, and it was the right decision. The paper has been read over 12,000 times, um, uh, it's been cited. So Dora, what, what Dora is pushing for is rather that the evaluation based on impact factor is the evaluation based on metrics that are related to the particular paper. So how many citations that paper has, how much interest it has developed, so very much um, paper-centric. So I'm very much pushing for that myself. So every time I'm in a committee and people are talking about impact factors, I shut them down and I say, this is not acceptable, we've signed DORA, blah, blah, blah. And I think every one of us needs to do that because impact factors are a game. So we have also published in high impact journals like Science Translational Medicine or Circulation Research. And I see no real difference in terms of the impact of the, of the paper itself. What I see is a very long difference in how, mu how many times we need to go through the review process, how many times, so if for example, we publish a paper in circulation research, impact factor I think is 15 now or something like that, and our paper was rejected I think three times, so, so w and I've also learned to reject the rejection, so I've also learned that I get a rejection and I write back to the editor and I say, you know, I don't agree with your re rejection for these reasons. And sometimes they take it. So I've also learned to not accept the rejection either. So it, but it's a game. So if it's a game. So if the first author wants to play the game and doesn't suffer through it, so I explain that it's a game and we're playing the game. And 
if that person doesn't get depressed every time we get rejected, then I'm happy to go through the process. But if they really care and they it, it, it affects their work because they are they are rejected, then I prefer just to publish somewhere else. And 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 in fact, I don't see a big difference in terms of citations uh, between the the different tracks, but it does help, it can help junior researchers. It doesn't necessarily, it's not the case necessarily, so the delays in publication are not good either. Mm. So Welcome Trust, just, just to t tell you this, they are really going for even ignoring the journals and they, they have now a, a new way of publishing called Welcome Open Research. That doesn't even need, so the paper gets automatically published online before pub, uh, peer review and then it goes through. I prefer having some peer review. I think it's beneficial yeah. if you if if it's con constructive. Yeah. Well, I couldn't agree more, but for example, if you have to do research in a country like Spain, what happens is that when you go for a grant, you go for a fellowship, you get points which yeah. are related to the number of Q1 or D1 journals that you're publishing. Yeah, so yeah. the system kind Needs of to change. pushes you to, to yeah. play the no, game. No, I agree. And, and I and fully agree also that for the junior researcher, I mean, it's a disaster because obviously you don't like rejections, especially not for your first papers. But yeah. So, I mean, I, I, because you're a junior, you don't know about these things, but I was... Can I not be recorded? <laughs> <laughs> we can edit it. So, <laughs> so please do, because <laughs> otherwise I get in trouble. So... I was in a meeting, I won't say the meeting, and there was a certain editor of a journal recently. And he wants to raise the impact factor, and he was to also decrease, they have a number, which is the, um, the, the percentage of the papers they accept of the ones that are submitted, okay? So th there are 1,000 papers submitted, they want to accept 12%. 12 uh, 12%. They have a number. So his goal in life was to decrease that number of 12% and increase the impact factor, okay? So the way he's decreasing the 12% is by encouraging more people to submit to his journal so we can all be rejected. <laughs> I'm serious about this. So, and, and, um, and, and then the other goal is increase the impact factor. So the Im increase in impact factor comes from not selecting the best research overall, so not that the paper has a really, you know, you submit a very good paper, but it's the area of the research. So they've noticed that diabetes gives a lot of uh, citations. So let's accept papers in diabetes. So if you come with a paper in whatever else, they don't want it, not because your paper is not good, they, they, they don't evaluate that, it's because the area, well they do evaluate that, but after, the area has been taken into account. So certain areas are going to be more widely accepted than others. So at the end, what does this mean to your research? Very little. I mean, you want to be in an important area and changing the mind, but, but the, 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 you know, the, the, the knowledge, but that those numbers really, I mean, I, I, and nobody said this is absolutely silly. So I have very similar experiences. Yeah, so I, I think as junior people, just kind of work on good paper, good work, follow the advice of your supervisors or not. <laughs> 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 but the impact factor is, uh, can open doors, but my experience is that you can also open doors with other, other journals and, and Frontiers, I've had a very good experience with Frontiers in terms of peer review. You want a solid peer review and then show the impact of your work in a different way. So what I would encourage you to do is, when you write a CV and you, you list your publications, not only list the publication, but explain why that work is significant and, how, you know, and, and show metrics of that significance. So if it has been cited many times or the industry is taking it up or you have discovered anything and kind of write a little text on it. I think that helps quite a lot. And, and don't put impact factor, just put the significance. And I think as, as, as junior people that might open more doors really, because they it would show that you're thinking about the significance of your work. If I may follow on that, I really believe that it's the, on the only way forward. Myself, uh, as a researcher, I have many times been frustrated by the fact that we put all those collections on the, on the, on the self and what is the meaning of that. We are all motivating for making an impact. And that's the story we need to tell. 
we all know how difficult it is to make research into clinical practice, but we all know that there are steps forward. And your PhD, rather than being a publication, it's a step forward towards making an impact. If you are able to explain your CV how that step forward was in the realm and of, of a PhD, you cannot solve the world in a PhD, but if you can explain how your research made a difference to someone in that big chain, that's the value. And in, in the UK, I, I think it's healthier in the way that that, that word of impact is now becoming the core of how you are evaluated in fellowships and things. I have not a good track of, of, of ex excellent publications as a first author, but I can be seen as someone that makes things happen, and I add that value in that chain. And that's what you need to show, and don't worry about those papers. W worry about the real world, the worry about how is my effort gonna make a difference or not, and understand what your role is in that big chain. And that's my my take here and also i think i think for more more um, senior uh, in general for everybody we need to change the system and that's hard but it's like in every meeting any committee everything it's like pushing those ideas f forward and it p in spain uh, big changes need to happen but again i mean i'm aware i'm i'm talking from a privileged position of somebody working in the uk in a top university funded by welcome trust so i i i think that needs to yeah, be, be taken into account, but but uh, changing the system from inside, I think it's also important. Okay, <coughs> so thank you very much. J just wanted to add that's that's a very important point, and I think for the youngest, so changing the system from inside uh, can be also uh, done through participation in a in scientific um, in scientific societies uh, in order than to be known and be involved as soon as possible in uh, evaluation committees for grants. So that's, that's something that's very doable in very short time after the PhD thesis. And uh, it, it really helps because that, that's the way you're also imposing your views because then people ask your opinion, so you give it. And uh, I recommend that too. And I recommend to have coffee maybe. <laughs> I was going to say that if no other questions, we have Blanca with us. We, have, <laughs> we can continue this uh, conversation outside. But thank you very much, Blanca, again. Thank you.